What's up, everybody? Top of the evening, top of the morning, wherever you are. Sunday Sessions, episode 43, where I deliver tons of information to help you scale out your e-commerce business. My name's Eric Castellano. Super excited to be here. And I hope everybody's enjoying their life, spending time with family, doing what matters. Because the nine to five, the day to day grind, all of that is awesome. But if you're not enjoying your life, what's the point? What is the point? There is no point. What's up, Nikki? What's up, everybody? So just to give you a rundown how this works, you post questions and I answer. Very simple. Uh, yeah, they increased the fees in February. So fee changes are in February. Yeah, so this is a great question. Would you consider purchasing a replenishable where you are most likely to be the only seller, which is nearly impossible, but not impossible, just nearly impossible, um, unless you have some sort of exclusive deal or it's a private label product. Um, would you consider purchasing a replenishable product where you're most likely to get the only be the only seller, because, but you're only making seventy five cents to a dollar, but the item is variation and sells consistently? Um, depends on the packaging of it, right? So if it's a one label item, then I'm cool taking it on uh, because what it will do is drive growth, drive product reviews, drive profits. I mean, it's super easy to package, but if it's a multi-pack and I have to poly bag it, I probably would not take that product on because the time in which it's going to take to package that inventory, I'm, I'm best suited packaging products with higher profit margins and profit dollar amounts or else I'm just wasting my time and spinning my wheels. And then another thing is like, does it qualify for small and light? There's some things to consider. Are there any discounts that Amazon could provide? Is it a grocery product? Is it a beauty product? So these are all things to consider when making that decision. Uh, let's say you send in a bunch of units and the listing gets taken down. What's the game plan and is it possible to um, avoid removal fees when relisting on a new ASIN? Um, so if a listing gets taken down, first thing you need to do is figure out why, right? And then see if there's a solution to get it backlisted. That's step number one. If all fails and you cannot get the product on, then unfortunately you'll have to create a removal order. Very rarely I've seen it happen, never with this instance where Amazon will relabel inventory for a listing that's been removed. Usually they'll only relabel inventory if you maybe sent it with the wrong FN SKU on the shipping side, right? Not after it's been in their warehouse and a listing was removed. What are your prerequisites for items you have to bundle? So our, our minimum dollar amounts just a little higher than single single sticker items, right? Because we're counting in the time. So for us, it's right around $2 for bundle items. You know, for you, it might be $350. It really depends on your production cost per ace and what it costs for you to get a product out the door. You know, that's something to consider as well when you're making decisions to buy products that are only making you a dollar. Let's say right now, based on your expenses and how many orders a month you're sending to Amazon, it's costing you three bucks to get one product to Amazon then that minimum buying requirement of a dollar doesn't even make sense anymore. Because before you even package it and send to Amazon, you're at a loss. Ooh, how many new products do we add every month? <sighs> Thousands, man. Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we're adding a lot of new products. I would say anywhere from 50 to 100 a day. Uh, do I prefer like regular wholesale or closeouts? I definitely prefer just wholesale. Um, we do do some closeout purchases. Actually, right before this call, I had a, a phone call with a gentleman over in the UK. And um, what did he say he was doing? I got his notes right here. 2.5. First year was a disaster. He's doing like 30K a month. And, and one of his main suppliers is a closeout distributor. So, you know, they definitely provide products at, at, at low prices. The only thing to really consider when you're buying from wholesale liquidation companies is uh, their invoices will work for any account health issues. I have 18K and would like to compound this money and reinvest it back into the business every month. Can I start with a prep center? Yeah, you can definitely start with a prep center. A lot of people think just because, you know, people have warehouses on social media that like it's a requirement to have a warehouse to sell on Amazon or to do wholesale is absolutely not a requirement. Just a guy about 45 days ago joined our inner circle does like $35 million a year. Dude only uses prep centers. Doesn't have a warehouse, 
right? Mainly uses virtual assistants. So a warehouse is definitely not a requirement. And realistically, I wouldn't suggest anybody just go rent one with zero experience on Amazon because you kind of got to kind of got to feel it out first. So you know what you're doing before you go investing more into your business. Uh, can we talk about how our program works? Yeah, so three main resources in our community. First is course content. This is the thorough breakdown of the exact systems and steps I use to train my team, right? My buying team, my warehouse team, my prep team, management, everybody. We give you that information, how to find suppliers, how to understand Amazon listings, get better at reading key charts, analyzing the competition, right? Analyzing ebbs and flows in the price out of stocks, BSR changes, um, negotiating discounts. That's a huge one. People talk to me all the time. I just saw a question, a question over here. How do you find profitable distributors? I imagine you already have some. You're probably just not leveraging discounts properly. So we teach you exactly all the discounts you can re request, what trade shows you could be going to. It's it's next level. And, and we're in the process for anybody who joins 1.0, you'll instantly get grandfathered into 2.0. And then you get access to our private Facebook community, about 800 or so Amazon sellers in there, 10 to 15 questions a day, very interactive group. I've learned a ton in that group and I've been selling on Amazon for over a decade um, or about a decade, it'll be a decade in July. And, and then you get four months of live weekly calls, right? So not similar to this because I go into much more detail on those calls and the questions um, get a little more time to be answered. This is more of just a general Q and A, uh, but on the live calls, you know, we're able to do screen shares and look at listings and share growth about what you should be doing quarter over quarter to grow your business. And it's a game changer, really. I think if you're it really, if you're selling on Amazon, it's, it's the community to be a part of. No, there's no, we don't buy wholesale from China. If you're buying stuff from China, it'll usually be, you know, manufacturing a, some sort of private label product. And anybody, I've seen websites like that where they offer like Dove products or, but it's coming from China. That shit ain't going to be real. So I wouldn't even mess with that. Not at all. David asks, what would you suggest to do when the buy box is suppressed on a product that has map and we can't go below? So once again, this is risk versus reward, right? You drop the price, you run the risk of the company no longer selling the product to you. But the reward is you get the cash back into your business. Now you don't drop the price, right? The risk is you sit on the inventory for a long time. The reward is you maintain the relationship with the supplier. So it's either one of the two scenarios. And typically if a product is map priced, the brand is not willing to do anything to help solve the issue, whether it's editing the listing, lowering the map price, then typically we will drop map price and break out of the inventory. It's just not making any money sitting there, right? And if the brand's not doing the proper communication, then I'd imagine any other products that they have, they're probably not communicating very well either. So it's like, what's the point? Drop the price kill the relationship, move on. Uh, how long did it take you guys to transition from Costco to opening wholesale accounts with brands? Um, so we did business with Sam's Club, Costco, BJ's for probably two, two and a half years before we really got into the wholesale space. And Sebastian went to his first trade show out in San Francisco and he met a, I think it was called Hemp Hearts. Might have been hemp parts. He met a, a brand at, at the trade show and he ended up purchasing like a half truckload of these hemp parts. And it was super exciting for us. And and that was really our first introduction into wholesale was getting that half truckload of, uh, of hemp parts. And then from there, we just continued to scale back on the RA and scale into the wholesale. Um, by attending more trade shows, connecting to suppliers through Google, and really building out that supply of data sheet. How do we get brand approval when they say we don't allow third-party sellers anymore? You're going to have to pitch them, man. You're going to have to convince them that you are a third-party fit for their company, right? And usually what this is for us is what we call a pitch deck. Um, so we put together a pitch deck of things we could help increase on their on their listings, whether it's images, SEO, bullet points, PPC management, um, just making sure that the information is accurate, the shipping weight, the size, all of that. 
Um, so really enhancing their listing because it's like anybody can reach out and connect and say, hey, I want to sell your products. But what's going to separate you from anybody else? You know, so delivering some sort of value proposition in order to convince them that you're the right fit. And something else I recommend is go to trade shows. Hop into your local. Everybody has a convention center probably within a couple hours of them, right? Unless you're maybe in like the middle of Montana. But I'm sure in a big city in Montana, there's probably a convention center, right? So Google local convention centers and start looking for some trade shows to hit up. Even if it's a smaller trade show, go there. It's going to give you the experience. It's going to teach you how to talk to these companies. Right. You're going to be able to learn their pain points. And this is an issue that I've dealt with myself. I'm so eager to close the deal that I don't even realize to ask them what they want to do with their brand. What is your vision for your brand on Amazon? Right. And then just shut up and listen to them talk. They're literally going to give you the roadmap to closing their deal by just asking what their vision for the brand is. They're going to tell you exactly what you need to come back with, you know? So opening up that line of communication is massive. So this person's question is, if a supplier is asking for references in your company and uh, you don't really have any yet. Um, so you can actually use your bank as a reference, especially if you've been banking with them for a while. Um, and you can use any other account you have net terms with as a reference. So it could be Uline, it could be a UPS account, it could be a Granger account, uh, Office Depot account, any, any account that you have net terms with, um, you can use to as a reference, right? And if you don't have um, any accounts with net terms, the goal would be to start opening some. Even if it's a smaller, like a Uline account, right? Or maybe we use a, a third-party logistics carrier, Unishippers, right? Which is a broker. They have net terms. They give us a net 30. So, like, that's an account you can add. Uh, no, we considered opening a warehouse in, in Central America. I mean, Central America, Central United States, like Indiana, Ohio kind of area. But we just never did. For, mainly for one reason, it's, it's either Sebastian or myself would literally have to go live there for multiple months to train the team because you can't just open a warehouse and, and think it's going to operate, right? Like it needs systems, it needs efficient processes, it needs frameworks, it needs management, it needs proper employment, um, it needs infrastructure. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of new business owners, I'm sure some of you listening now, make in the beginning, right? They treat it like a side hustle. And if you're gonna treat anything like a side hustle, you're gonna make side hustle money. But if you treat it like a full-time income and you treat it like your baby and you treat it like the things that's gonna absolutely revolutionize the rest of your life, right? And allow you to invest in other things and have time freedom and financial freedom and travel the world, or maybe invest in that house that you've been waiting to purchase or pay off that student debt. Like if you wanna do that, then you cannot treat it like a side hustle because side hustles make side hustle money. And we're not in this to make side hustle money. Some people are, and that's perfectly cool. And I support that as well. We got a lot of people in my community. They just want to make an extra couple thousand dollars a month. That's cool. But for me, that's not what I'm in this for. I'm in this to literally change my life. Pull as much cash out of Amazon as humanly possible, invest it into other things that provide for my family, and also give you all the roadmap on how to do it too. Because I've been there already. I've done it. I've been doing it. I'm still doing it. And I want to show you how to do it too. Pharma packs. So yeah, pharma packs, they're just liquidated inventory. You'll see them still around. Um, but actually, let's pop them up. Let's pop them up. Let's see where they are. Selleratings.com. Let's do pharma packs. They're no longer an active seller. It says they're officially gone from Amazon. Unless they change their name. Hold on. I don't think I searched it right. Yeah. That's very odd. I don't see them. I don't see them anywhere. Oh no, here they are. Oh, it's the brand is Pharma Packs. That's why the listing's there. I'm gonna start. Maybe on the next live I do, I'll do a screen share. Maybe right? we'll dive into some listings together. How does that sound for everybody? I think that'd be really cool. Give me a fire emoji if you if you'd like to see that. And maybe something you can even do is like you submit your ASINs before it, right? Before I go live, I'll put a QA on, on Instagram. You submit your ASINs and then we'll do a fucking live review of them. I think that would be really cool. But yeah, I don't see Pharma Packs anywhere on Amazon anymore. Heading to the Sweets and Snack Expo this week in Chicago. Awesome, Miguel. Excited you're making it out there. What's something to look into besides closing accounts with suppliers and deals? 
um, market research, right? So ask a lot of these companies because a lot of them are going to give you backlash. It's very common at trade shows. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to get to talk in. Somehow it's going to come up that you're in e-commerce and they're instantly going to shy away from you, right? But the goal is to engage them. And similar to what I talked about a few minutes ago, ask them questions, right? You need to pinpoint the reason why they don't like you. Usually it's because of a few things. One, they've had a very poor experience with another third-party seller that's ruined their perspective on Amazon. You can change that. That's not impossible. Two, they're currently selling their products on Amazon themselves or Amazon is selling their products on Amazon themselves through 1P, right? 1P direct, vendor direct. Now, this doesn't mean it's impossible to close them. Vendor Direct has terrible net terms. They deal with the same customer support we deal with. They have little management over pricing control, if any, right? Amazon, they're at the, they're at the helm of Amazon. So whatever Amazon wants to do, they have to do. So that's another reason you need to ask those questions. So you know what you need to come back with. And then the third reason is maybe they're already working with some third-party Amazon sellers. So if they're working with some third-party Amazon sellers is one thing that I've learned over the past 10 years of doing this is Amazon sellers are going to fuck up. They're going to make mistakes and sellers are going to drop them. I've been dropped. I used to manage a $3 million account called Cello Wisps. It's now just Wisps, but they dropped me. They went with a separate third-party seller who was more of a health food seller specifically. They only carried health food. So they dropped us and we lost a $3 million a year account, right? So it's like prying and asking these questions to get this information. You're going to leave there with a lot of knowledge of what you can deliver to these brands to help close those accounts. Now, Sweets and Snacks Expo, it's a little tougher to close accounts on the spot. It's more about gaining the intel and then getting on a follow-up call with them, really about the process and how you're their preferred third-party partner. And also do your research before, man. Pop into that vendor directory, pop into it, explore it, and create a roadmap for yourself, right? Like, hey, I'm getting here on this day and this is where I'm starting. These are the 15 booths that I definitely have to go see. Navigate, hit all those 15 booths, and then after that, you kind of got some freestyling to do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a wholesaler trying to add a product that requires transparency barcode, but the product doesn't have any. How do you go about that? So the only way to get transparency barcodes is for the vendor that manages the transparency account to add your merchant ID on the back end of 2D transparency which is nearly impossible because the reason why they enrolled their brand in 2D transparency was to get people like you not be able to sell it, right? So it was a way to manage and control their listing. So getting those 2D transparency barcodes is going to be nearly impossible. I have some products enrolled in 2D transparency. And if someone reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like to sell your products enrolled in 2D transparency, I wouldn't even respond to the message, right? Because what value does that bring to me? It takes away all, it, it, it allocates a percentage of sales to someone else. So unfortunately with 2D transparency, there's not many options. Now, can you connect to the brand and see if they'll give it to you? Absolutely. Are the chances that they're gonna happen high? Absolutely not. They're almost non-existent. Um, and we like AZ Insight as a little, uh, a little toggle at the top that lets you know if it's 2D transparency protected, but also something we've realized in the past couple months is that if a product is newly enrolled in 2D transparency, that little, that little flag will come up. So we've actually made some poor purchases in the past couple months where we've gotten, you know, 100 units of this, 100 units of that. And by the time it gets to us and we try sending it on a shipment, it is then 2D transparency enabled and we cannot. You know, and that's just part of the business. It's cost to do a business. And that's another reason why product research is super important. Scott, make sure you know which are considered meltable too for the sweet candy and sweet snack, the sweets and snacks expo. Hundred percent. You know, we actually uh, we brought on a new brand that I was about to take exclusive. I went and met them. They're a uh, New Jersey brand. I, I went and met them. This was actually probably about a year ago. Had a phenomenal conversation with the brand. The goal was to get Amazon lit to it be their exclusive seller on. Amazon, right? So I said, all right, the way most relationships start off, it's not exclusive from the rip. You place, just place some orders, you build a relationship. 
you know, you, you feel out each other through the process. So we placed an order, it's like four or five thousand bucks. First order sold really well. Second order sold really well. Um, and then uh, April came and turns out that a lot of their products were considered meltable. So I connected with the brand and I said, hey, I love some documentation. I gave them the prerequisites of what Amazon requires, documenting that it has a flash point greater than, I believe, 150. Um, and they told me that they cannot provide that documentation because their products do not have a flash point greater than that number. So, you know, here I am thinking that this is a brand we're going to be able to take exclusive. And then they tell me, hey, if you want the exclusive, you're going to have to sell these FBM to the summer months. And that's just not something we want to deal with as a company uh, for two reasons. One, we don't do any FBM. We used to do a lot. We don't do any. And two, I don't want to deal with any customer returns or complaints for melted products on their doorsteps. So it's definitely something to consider. Uh, we do not do FBA in Canada and Mexico. We turned off um, Canada and Mexico, only because we get a lot of account health violations in those other countries. Um, so with FBA missing inventory, uh, if you're 100% sure it was correct and shipped, first you got to wait until the shipment's eligible for reconciliation. If it's not eligible for reconciliation, there's nothing you can do yet. A lot of times sellers get super concerned, oh, my inventory is missing, and then the, the inventory is reconciled, and all of a sudden it shows up. If it's reconciled and the inventory is still missing, we suggest submitting invoicing as well as any documentation you have from shipping that inventory, preferably with weights on it, right? Because Amazon is going to want to verify that you did in fact send this inventory and that you did in fact purchase this inventory. So we'll help solidify that is invoicing and shipping documentation that it was in fact sent. Um, so the products that we do have that we can't send in due to the transparency, um, A, we're, we'll see if there's a vendor return, right? If we can, if we can return it, if, if the solution or if the problem was figured out immediately. Most of our vendors have like a 72 uh, discrepancy window. So if it's over that, usually we won't. Um, and then we make a decision to either uh, liquidate it through a donation or sell it at the flea market, sell it to employees, really whatever we got to do to get rid of it. But keep in mind, you're not going to get 100% of the value out of that. Awesome, everybody. This has been an honor and privilege. I love spending my, my time with you and just really, you know, providing insights. And I hope you got some sort of piece of information, any nugget that you can implement into your company. Right. These these calls are they're really all over the place. Right. It's whatever questions you have, we're going through. Um, but I appreciate your time. I hope everybody has a safe and healthy weekend. And I look forward to seeing some of you at some of these events coming up um, just for a quick little breakdown. June 1st and 2nd, I'll be in Austin at SellerCon. Um, August 1st and 2nd, I'll be at Ecom Summit in Chicago. And then August 31st, I will be at Spams United in Newark, New Jersey. So appreciate y'all. Have a beautiful night. Stay late.